Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, such a good day to everyone. So for today we're going to take a look at the physiology of hearing. Alright. And I really hope that um, all of you had a quick recap before this class on the anatomical structures of hearing so that when we go through on the physiology of the hearing, uh, it will make you easy to understand on the content. Alright. So without further ado, let's take a look at the learning outcome of this physiology of hearing. So first and foremost, as usual, you need to understand the structures of the hearing first before you get to know its functions. All right? In physiology, we're going to take a look at its functions related to its structures. All right? On the second one, on the mechanisms of the hearing. So how does our brain perceive that sound as a certain sound? Okay? And then for the last, we're going to take a look at the consequence of hearing abnormality. So it means that any functional structures of the structures, when it gets something wrong with it, so you might have a problem with the hearing. All right? Let's take a look at this one and let's have a quick recap on the functional structures of hearing. Basically, our ear are divided into three parts. So we have the external ear, which is the outer ear. If you take a look at this uh, schematic diagram on the blue regions right over here, all right, so it's the outer ear. And then in the middle ear, which is color-coded as the light uh, yellow, all right, the regions in the tympanic cavity. And the uh, last part is actually the inner ear, all right? So when something the, uh, the part from the auditory tubes and the uh, cochlea lah. Alright, so let's move on or focus on the external ear and its function. So basically, our uh, external ear okay, consists of the pinna, right? So this is the chupping cleaner, pinna, the outer ear. And then we have the external auditory cornea, uh, canal and sometimes we call it as the air canal or uh, yeah, the air canal. And then we have the ear loop, so it's just the accessory, right? And then basically the functions of the pinna, the 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 like why the pinna is actually look like a um, like wider as compared to the ear canal is basically to collect the sounds that come into it and to conduct the sounds wave to the middle ear. Okay, so this is the functions of the external ear or the pinna itself. So basically the outer ear consists of one third. Uh, cartilaginous and another two third is actually the bony structures. So the bony structures is basically coming from the temporal bone inwards. All right. Uh, other than that, in the external ear or the outer ear, we also have a sebaceous gland to produce the air wax. And basically, all of this component, the external ear, going to produce fifteen decibels higher than the sounds that coming in. All right. So meaning that it will collect all the sounds we have that coming into it and increase it to 15 decibel right so db is actually the decibel lah. all right so and then uh, basically it is due to its shape so let's this is just a ear of a human so let's take a look at the ear of the other animals for example like elephant okay so they have a really uh, big pinna but that uh, biggest ear the biggest or wider pinna is not only functions for the elephant. Eh? It's not only functions to collect the sounds information coming to it, but it also acting like a manual, manual fan. Ah, okay. But for this one, it's basically for human, it's basically to collect the, the sounds when they're coming in. Alright, so now let's take a look at the middle ear. So in the middle ear, it's actually starting from this tympanic membrane. Right? This one, the round shape like structure, shape like mem round shape like membrane right over here. We call it as the tympanic, tympanic membrane. Okay, so it's regions from the tympanic cavity, alright, this is a tympanic cavity and in this tympanic cavity, it's basically the air filled compartment that is located in the temporal bone, alright. So basically it doesn't have like fluid or what inside it, but it is actually the air filled cavity, alright. So in this middle ear, basically at these regions, like uh, the one that uh, tap to the um, cochlea, okay, the snail like structures over here, at the end of the right cornea, like the one that I pointed with my laser right over here, basically consists of two windows, right? So not a Microsoft window or so whatnot, but it is actually known as the oval window. And another one, they have a window which is called as the round window. So we're going to take a look what is the functions of the oval window and round window later on. Now let's take a look at these structures of the 
uh, middle ear first, right? So other than that, in the middle ear, we have the bones, by which this bone collectively called as the ossicles. They are consist of malleus, malleus, incus, and also stapes. All right. So, uh, yeah. So this uh bones are actually being like attached to the structures of the in, uh, middle ear by two ossicular muscles all right so this is the uh, tympanic membrane which i uh, mentioned to you just now or sometimes we call it as the eardrum why eardrum because it looks like a drum and it functions like a drum okay and if let's say we're having an inflammation towards the tympanic membrane they call it as the tympanitis Alright, so this function is not only to act as the mechanical barrier for the foreign uh, substance or foreign particles to get into the middle ear, but it also functions to act as a drum by which it's going to produce a vibrations when the sound frequencies come from the outer ear and tap on top of the membrane. So it's going to produce a vibration. So that all of these vibrations can be collected by the middle ear to be transmitted as the sounds perceptions. Alright. Okay, so uh, sometimes we can say that this tympanic membrane are acting like a resonator. Okay, so now let's move on to the ossicles, which is the mis, malleus, incus, and stapes. So now let's take a look at the footprint of stapes first. Uh, Alright, so here, uh, this is the structures of the stapes, okay? The one that looks like a fork with two, uh, two teeth, right? Over here is a stapes, but anyway, there is a foot plate right there, so that's why we call it as the foot plate of stapes. Alright, so the foot plate of stapes is actually attaching to the oval window, or it is actually are connected to the oval window. Why? Because these foot plates of stapes are actually the one that going to knock the oval window to transmit the vibrations that are coming from the eardrum and then transmitted to the ossicles and then passed to the oval window by knocking the oval window uh, by which these action, actions are taken care by the foot blade of stapes, right? So the vibrations that uh, produced by the tympanic membrane are actually going to be transmitted by all of this ossicular bone. That's why we call it as the ossicular, ossicular change, all right? So it's going to knock the window like a piston, right? The movement of the um, uh, knocking is actually inwards and Upwards, so macam the ketuk lah, macam you ada one shift. The oval window is actually a membrane. Eh? They, 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 it's not open. It's actually like a sheet of membrane that are being attached uh, with a foot plate, and then this foot plate is like talk, uh, like knocking, pushing the window in and in and out, out movement, like a like a pistons. Okay, piston tu apa? Piston tu yang dalam engine kereta tu. Okay, so the inward and outward movement are basically going to give a pressure towards the inner ear. Okay, the perilim in the inner ear. We're going to take a look at it later on. Don't worry. We just right now focusing on the middle ear first. So if let's say the person is having the pathology uh, at the ossicles, they call it as the auto otosclerosis lah. If you have the uh, bony fixations of the stapes and whatnot. So, you are not able to produce the uh, vibrations. So, the, the vibrations that produced by the uh, tympanic membrane cannot be transmitted by the ossicles to the over, to the over window. Uh, it could be a problem. Okay, so basically, uh, the, the step piece is actually the smallest bone we can, bar, we can found in our in human body. Uh, so, if we take a look at this uh, right uh, image, so this is actually the size of the foot plate of step piece. Right? So, this is a malleus. This is the malleus, this is the incus, and this one is the uh, stapes bone. Okay. So now let's take a look at the two ossicular muscles. Just now I did mention that we have three ossicles bones by which these ossicles are attached, are being attached to the structures of the middle ear by the ossicular muscles. We have two ossicular muscles. Number one is the tensor tympani muscles. Alright. So why its name is tensor tympanic muscle? Because it's going to give a tense to the tympanic membrane, but it is a muscle. So that's why we call it as the tensor tympanic muscles. And another one we have a smaller muscles right down here, is actually known as the stapedius muscles. Why stapedius muscles? Because it is attached or bind to the stapes stapes bone. Okay. 
So if let's say the person having a paralysis to this tapedius muscles or having paralysis to this uh, two muscles and temporomandibular muscles, it can uh, make difficulty to make the bone to be elastic and vibrate effective effectively. Yeah, all right. So uh, there is one condition by which we call it as the tensor. Uh, tensor tympanic reflex or sometimes we call it as the tympanic reflex or acoustic reflex so acoustic ni apa lah so dengar acoustic ni macam orang cakap or band, music ke apa kan so acoustic is actually a music lah or a sound so tympanic reflex or sometimes we call it as the acoustic reflex is basically the the body reflex that produced by the tympanic muscles to decrease the damage towards our towards our inner ear from the loud sound alright so basically um Looking at this one, alright, so basically our eardrum are very elastic and it can uh, vibrate, uh, uh, what do we call, vibrate according to the sounds or the sound wave that knocking on it. But if let's say the sound wave is too hard or too loud, so this uh, muscles are going to be contracted so that it reduce the, re the, 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 what do we call, the, flexibility of the muscles and the flexibility of the bone so that it can like produce or reduce the the noise that coming into the ear and then prevent the damage to the to the ear so this is what we call as the tympanic reflex or acoustic reflex okay uh, just take a look at the examples like um, when you go to a uh, band performance for example eh? okay you go to the band performance sometimes they're going to give you the earplug so you put in to your ear but if let's say they don't give you the earplug you're getting into the band at the beginning you might feel like oh there are very loud noise that coming into your ear but at a certain time you might feel like oh i'm adaptable to the sounds so why you are adaptable to that sound that's because the tympanic uh, muscles all the muscles are actually having the tympanic reflex therefore it's like constrict the muscles okay and then it's reduced the vibrations that being produced by the tympanic membrane as well as the knocking on the uh, oval window by the foot plate of stapes. All right. So now let's take a look at the eustachian tube. So other than the one that the two that I mentioned just now, we also have the uh, eustachian tube that located in the middle ear. So if you look at the schematic diagram, the red in color right over here is actually the eustachian eustachian tube that's why i said that the middle ear is actually the air field cavity so the eustachian tube is actually the air field cavity lah so basically its function is to equalize the air pressure in both sides of the tympanic membrane in both sides of the tympanic membrane so basically this um eustachian tube you might feel its presence when you write an a plane Okay, when you write an aeroplane, for example, like reaching to the 35,000 speed, for example, okay, from KL to uh, KL to Terengganu, okay, you might feel that something is blocking your ear. So, that uh, what happened at initially is actually the changes in the air, air pressure at the sea levels and also at the 35 feet on the, on, on the atmosphere. So, basically, the air pressure at the um, sea level is higher comparing to the high altitude that's why the pressure going to push the tympanic membrane outside so in a way for you to 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 release the air pressure that coming to your ear is actually by swallowing the uh, saliva huh? as well as blowing the blowing the nose uh, cover uh, like like uh, uh, pinch your nose and blow the air or uh, pinch your nose pinch uh, close your mouth and blow the air out all right so basically the maneuver that actions are basically going to open the chambers so that to equalize the air between the outside and the middle middle ear all right so here let's come to the summary of the functions of the middle ear i don't want to get touched it's too much because i bet that you have learned this in anatomy so let's take a look at the summary so basically, the functions of the middle ear is to receive the sound wave coming from, like starting from the tympanic membrane, and then it transmits the sound wave through the tympanic membrane and also the ossicular change, which is a missed bone just now, the ossicular bone. And then anyway, 
this um, acicular bone and whatnot, they are going to amplify the sound wave. So how much they did amplify the sound wave? It's basically 22 times. Right, so basically the ratio of the tympanic membrane to the oval window basically 17 to 1 ratio. Okay, so the 17 is the tympanic membrane and the oval window is only 1. Therefore, it's 70 times already. And the acicular change is handled is basically 1.3 times longer. So when you times out, it's basically 22 times higher from the sound set coming in. So that's why we call it as the amplifications of sound wave. So means that it's uh, um, enhance the sound set coming into it. Alright, so we call it as the impedance, impedance matching. matching. And number four, its function is to equalize the air pressure and as well as it's going to protect the, uh, the ear from the damage by using the tympanic reflex. Okay, now let's move on to the inner ear. In the inner ear, it's basically we have the bony labyrinth, right? So, uh, the one that purple in color, if you take a look at this uh, right uh, diagram, so the purple in color outside the outermost layer is basically the bony labyrinth and the blue in color inside is actually the membranous labyrinth. So why they call it as the bony labyrinth and membranous labyrinth is depending on the structures that it made from. So if let's say it's formed by the bone, so it is bony labyrinth, when it is formed or shaped by the membranes, so we call it as the membranes labyrinth. So basically in the bony labyrinth and membrane lab labyrinths, they consist of a fluid by which known as the perilim and as well as endolim. Alright, so why perilim means that peripherals mean outside the perilim. Endolims because it's located inside, that's why they call it as the endolim. Alright, so this bony labyrinth, this membranous labyrinth, uh, the, the, the one like snail like structures, is basically the auditory apparatus. Right, as well as the vestibular apparatus. So the one that uh, spiral in shape, the one that look like a snail, is basically the cochlea, by which used for auditory. And for the uh, one that look like a handle on top of it, is actually the vestibular apparatus. All right, both are actually having a different properties. Lah, what are both? Different properties means that the cochlea, the vestibular apparatus, perilim and endolim, when they comes with difference in names, difference. They must have a difference in characteristic and difference in function. Okay. So I did mention that in our uh, inner ear we have the labyrinth structures, bony and membranous, by which they consist of perilim and endolim, endolim, right? So they are actually different in endolim and perilim characteristics. So the endolim is nature are actually like the ECF endolim as well, but for the endolim, it is actually located in the scala media. Okay, medium mean medium lah. For the perilim, it's located in the scala tympani and scala vestibulum. So this is a scala tympani, uh, scala tympani down here, and on top of it, it is a scala vestibulum. Okay, uh, in the middle is we call it as a scala scala media. So it means that the endolim is located in this orange region, and the perilim perilims is located in the blue regions over here. All right, both are actually the fluids, but what different in these components of the fluid is that endolim it rich in potassium and poor in sodium but for the perilim it is poor in potassium and rich in sodium so why is that so so bear in mind in our body these ions play a major role in the generations of the action potentials basically the sodium and potassium all right sodium potassium and also calcium so sodium and potassium in the endolim and perilim they play a major role in the transactions or generations of the action action potential so bear in mind any stimulus that come into our body before we can produce a response it must be converted into the electrical signal first okay so what is the electrical signals that we are talking about so this electrical signals is actually the action potentials then only our nerve transmit the action potentials to the higher brain regions to the cerebral to the other parts of the brain to the uh, um, spinal cord and whatnot then only our body can produce the output by which producing the mechanical changes or mechanical response all right so similarly to the hearing mechanisms uh, the, the the how we can perceive that sound is from the mechanical input that come into it by which the sound wave and this sound wave going to be 
translated into electrical energy first, which is the action potential. So what are the things that contributes to the action potentials or generations of the action potentials in the hearing structures is this one, all right, endolin and also perilin. Okay, other than that, there is uh, there are other structures, but now we are talking about the endolin and perilin first, okay? All right, so now let's move on to the structures in the inner ear, which is going to play the major roles in the hearing, which is the cock cochlea. All right. All right, so in the cochlea, okay, so we have our cochlea, let take a cross section of the cochlea over here right at the the one that attached to the oval window if you take a look at the structures this one is actually the base and the one that spiral inwards into the end is actually called as the apex okay so let's take a look one cross section one cross sections of the cochlea okay we make a cut and then you can see that on top of it we have the scala vestibuli and down here we have a scala tympani and in the middle we have a scala media so just a recall in the scala vestibuli and scala tympani we have the perilin because it's located peripherally and in the scala media we have the endo endolin because it is located endo endo lah, means it is located inside okay so uh, scala vestibuli it separates from the middle ear by the oval window at the base all right and it's basically filled with perilim and if you take a look at the apex of the scala vestibuli okay macam ni kita tak nampak kan okay this is the um just take a look at this structure first so you have the scala vestibuli on top of here if you uh, spread it open we have a scala vestibuli by which it separate the me uh, middle ear to the to uh, with the inner ear by the oval window by which this oval window are attached with a foot plate of stapes okay anyhow this perilims in the scala vestibuli and the scala tympani are actually are connected to each other so how they get connected to each other how they are perilim as well right both in these regions they have perilim but how they connected to each other by this at the apex of the cochlea okay this is the base of the cochlea and at the end is the apex of cochlea cochlea there is one hole by which that hole we call it as the helicostroma so the fluids the perilims in the scala vestibuli are get connected with the fluid or the perilim in the scala tympani okay by the helico helicostroma okay so this one is the oval window and if you take a look at this color tympani at the base they are actually separated with the inner ear by the round round window okay uh, this is what we talk about just now all right so now let's take a look at the scala tympani i did mention to you already by which they have the round window at the uh, separating uh, the inner ear from the middle ear okay so other than that we have a scala media in the middle it has the endolim and it's actually the scala media if you take a look at it it's actually are separated by the oval window as well yeah okay as uh sorry separated by the round window as well and sometimes this round window we call it as the second tympanic membrane okay so because this one okay dekat sini eh sini round window okay so we have one tympanic membrane the, the the first and foremost the tympanic membrane and a second one we have a round window by which this round window does not being attached by any structure therefore sometimes they call it as the second uh, tympanic membrane okay all right so um, what else i did mention that in the scala media it reach it filled with endolim and this endolim reach in potassium ion okay so if you take a look at the base of the basilar membrane okay this is a scala media and uh, at the base of the scala media structures we have one region by which we call it as the basilar membrane uh, so it's actually a membrane like structure by which on top of the basilar membrane we have the hearing organ so this is actually our hearing organ located so our hearing log organ located on top of the basilar membrane and we call it as the organ of corti. Corti tu sebenarnya cortex lah. 
organ of Corti and in this organ of, of Corti it's basically house the receptors for hearing okay okay so now let's take a look at the organ of Corti so in the organ of Corti if we take a look at it we have a receptors of hearing and the receptors of hearing we call it as the hair cell receptors okay the hair cell what do we call it as the hair cells okay now let's take a look at its structures so other than the cell like structures on top of it they have a cilia due to its functions for the cells we call it as the stereo cilia uh, it's look like the hair that's why we call it as the hair hair cell okay if let's say in the future when people uh, ask you a questions so where can you find the hair that consists of hair that consists of at the cells that consists of hair so you can say the hair cells nanti orang cakap rambut awak pula no these are actually the cells for the hearing and equilibrium okay so basically when we talk about the receptors we know already that even not only for hearing even for the pain stimulus other stimulus all of it must first come with the mechanical receptors that touch the receptors or activate the receptors then the receptors going to change all the mechanical uh, input into the electrical signals then bring uh, via the nervous systems to the higher brain centers for the perceptions of the sounds and the feed feedback similarly to the hearing process so the sounds that coming to our ear is actually in a form of wave that's why they call it as a sound wave right so it's coming like a wave this wave is actually produce a mechanical impact on the tympanic membrane and then these sounds wave going to be transmitted through the ossicular bones and then transmit to the oval window and then get into the peri perilin in the scala vestibuli and then knock on the resinal membrane then touch on the tectoral membrane then only it's going to translate or transduce this mechanical impact or mechanical energy into the electrical signal so who are the one that are responsible to change the mechanical energy into the electrical signals is the hair hair cells okay then only they can send the information to the brain all right so uh, the function or the organ of quality is to convert the sound wave the mechanical energy into the actions potentials in the cochlear cochlear nerve okay so this is the hair cells that i mentioned just now they have like the innovations okay this innovation is actually the cochlear cochlear nerve okay in the arrangement of the hair cells we have a uh, two types of arrangement lah on the outer side we call it as the outer hair cells and the inner side we call it as the inner inner hair cells okay so basically if you take a look at the outer hair cells and inner hair cells uh, first look at the numbers of the cells that are being distributed in the basilar membrane you can see that we have the uh, a, a majority uh, or the vast number of the outer hair cells located in the basilar membrane and only a few numbers only one row of the inner hair cells located in the basilar membrane but somehow the inner hair cells receive a major innovations comparing to the outer outer hair cells okay so if we zoom in at one hair cells you can take a look like this one all right so at the base of the hair cells uh, so this is the base of the hair cells get down at the bottom one you can see that they are actually acting like the other neuron cells okay the other cells to convert to convert the uh, mechanical energy into electrical energy all right and uh, by which this base are actually going to have a synapse with the efferents efferents fiber so this is the efferents fiber okay and then if you take a look at on top of the hair cells you will see that each of the cilia or stereocilia they are actually connected to each other by a change right so this change what do we call it as the actin actin filament and it is actually surrounded by the myosins all right so because it is connected from tips to tips so we call it as a tip tip link okay so why they are connected to each other because um, the movement of the hair cells are actually going to influence the uh, influx of the uh, potassium ion because this one is bath 
in the scala media valve in the endolin that reach in the potassium so the bending of the stereocilia going to uh, influence the influx of the potassium does generates the uh, difference in the uh, uh, membrane membrane potentials when there is influx of the potassium so the cells going to be de depolarized all right so these depolarizations are actually the ones that can trigger the uh, transmissions of the action potentials the uh, uh, release of the neurotransmitters and then with the subsequent process of the transmissions of the uh, action potentials okay so this is uh, just another additional image how does the tips links of the stereocilia uh, look like okay so uh, on top of the basilar membrane we have a leaf like structures over here we call it as the tectoral tectoral membrane right, so now let's take a look at the first image first okay this is the one uh, this is a scala vestibuli again and this is a resonant membrane okay and this is a tectoral membrane. So how does the, the, the stereocilia of the hair cells being bent is actually when the sound wave comes. Okay, so to the next study. When the sound wave comes, alright, and it attached to the tympanic membrane, it going to cause vibrations of these ossicles. And the, the vibrations of the ossicles causes the pushings of inwards and outwards of the foot plate of stapes, thus producing a wave in the peri perilymph. Okay, so bear in mind that is this is the resonant membrane. Okay, okay. Now we move to the resonant membrane. Okay, so this is the resonant membrane. When the wave are hitting the resonant membranes, it's going to compress the fluid or the endolim in the scala media, thus causing the tapping or tapping on top of the tectoral membrane. Thus, when the tectoral membrane are bending downwards, okay, it's going to push the stereocilia away. Uh, so then when the wave hit the resonant membrane thus causing the tectoral membrane to be pushed downwards it's going to push away the cilia thus causing the changes in its positions all right then uh, generating the action potentials okay so that's how the bending of the stereo cilia in the hair cells happen okay starting from the mechanical energy that coming from the wave from the air into the fluid field compartment then bending the stereo cilia okay so this is what i did mention about the innovations on the hair cells so each hair cells you can see in the inner hair cell even though its distributions is a little comparing to the outer hair cells ohc is outer hair cells but somehow the innovations for the inner hair cell is greater comparing to the outer one Okay, and then all of these uh, innovations going to be gathered and forming the uh, auditory divisions, with is, uh, which is the eight cranial nerve, and this eight cranial nerve will send the information to the brainstem. Okay, so this is uh, auditory uh, efferent pathway. So where does this um, sound information being transmitted in our nervous system? In our auditory system this is actually from the hair cell itself to the spiral ganglion to the vestibular cochlear eight nuclei and cochlear nuclei and then it going to in the pons itself it's going to like uh, switch from left to right and right to left that's why sometimes the sound is coming just from one side but both of the ear can perceive that perceive that sounds by which it's overlapping in the um it's not overlapping lah it's changed the information at the superior overlap uh of olivary nuclei and then towards the inferior colliculi media geniculate body and then to the primary auditory cortex in the proximal area of your brain all right okay mm, okay olivary cochlear bundle is actually a cholinergic cholinergic neuron so when we say cholinergic neuron from my previous lecture on the autonomic nervous system we say cholinergic neuron so we understand that this cholinergic neuron is actually a neuron that release acetal acetylcholine by which it can cause the depolarizations all right so now let's take a look on the mechanisms of hearing okay before we go further and uh, looking at the uh, physiology of hearing the mechanisms of hearing we 
first needs to understand about the property of the sound wave. Alright? So, in a sound wave, sound wave itself are actually the alternate compression uh, compressions and refractions of a molecule that strike the tympanic mem membrane. Okay? So, if you take a look at this uh, graph, it's showing the amplitudes of the sound wave. The, uh, when they are at positive um, uh, grid or positive regions, we call it as the compressions. Basically, it's like this. And downward here is called as the ref refractions. So, sound wave is actually alternate compressions and refract refraction. By which this sound wave, whenever it is, like when you're striking a, a strings of a guitar, for example, it's going to produce a vibrations, right? So, these vibrations are actually produ producing a wave. Bila kita cakap sound je, at any time, you will imagine it as a sound, coming in as a as a wave. So, these sound waves are actually later going to strike our tympanic, tympanic membrane. And then, when it strikes our tympanic membrane, at a certain point, we can say, oh, I hear a, a sound of a, of a guitar. So, but how does the process occur? Alright, so we're going to take a look at it later in the mechanisms of airing. Before that, we need to understand that the wave is actually originating from a vibrating, vibrating sounds at any, at anywhere. Even though a drum, even though when you're knocking a table, uh, when you hear to the uh, to your uh, music set via your handphones or whatnot, or either when you had listen to a speech. So that vibration is coming from the vocal vocal cord. Okay, uh, when you speak, it's actually coming from the vocal cord. It's not only the the sound wave can travel in the air, the sound wave as well can travel in the water. That's why in our ear compartment, we have the air field cavity from the outer and the middle ear, as well as the fluid field fluid field cavity. So meaning that not only human on the earth on the air, okay, can listen but animals under the water as well can can listen like the one that produced by the dolphins okay like the whales they're producing a sounds to communicate to each to each other so means that the sounds wave can travel in both uh, air as well as the water or fluid field cavity fluid lah fluid all right so now uh, if you take a look at the property of the sound itself in the air the sounds can uh, be at the speed of 340 milli, milli, millimeter per second in a 20 degree Celsius. But uh, we can say that this is uh, greater in a hot environment compared to the cold environment as well as in high high altitude comparing to the lower lower altitude. So it means that if you are at the mountain, okay, that's why you can hear a, 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 a nice and clear azan sound, for example. For example, like Sheikh Muzaffar going to, to be in the moon Okay, uh, moon, uh, yeah, in a moon, on a moon, or in a moon. Then he said that like, you can clear, you can listen clearly to the azan sounds and whatnot. It's because when you are at a high altitude, the air pressure or the, uh, what do we call the, the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is lesser, then the sound wave can travel faster, right? And not only that, the sound wave is greater in the sea water as well compared to the fresh water. Why? Because of the presence of the molecules in different types of water. In the sea water, there is a sodium and another molecules that present in there that are going to like push the sound wave greater. Okay, so now let's move on to we done with the amplitude and wavelength. Okay, tadi okay. I uh, so one uh, sounds. Compression and pressure is one wavelength. Right now, let's move on to the frequency. Okay, so frequency yeah, macam bila awak nak dengar radio kan? Uh, frequency berapa? Oh, uh, apa? Uh, 105.9 FM. Uh, so, tu frequency lah. So, basically, uh, when uh, uh, frequency is actually expressed as a number of a wave per second. So, when there is a high number of a wave per second, so means that it is high frequency or having large frequency when there is high frequency or large frequency basically the sound is in high pitch okay uh, and vice versa lah. okay so basically the sounds that the human can hear is in a range of 20 to 2000 hertz so it means that we can we can listen to these sounds but the thing is 
our ear is only sensitive to the sounds with the frequencies of 1000 to 4000 hertz. Okay. Uh, other than this sound wave, sometimes we also, what we are listening right now, right now, like let's say I'm speaking right now, while you're listening to my lecture, you or your brother is, your brother or your sisters or your families are like watching TV, okay, and then your brother or little sister are playing games, alright, so there are a lot of sounds that's coming in, so that a lot of sounds means producing a different wave, wavelength, so we call it as a, a complex wave sounds or complex sounds, sounds wave. So it's coming with more than one frequency. And then that sound is not only that, but sometimes if let's say you are going to a, a performance like like a pergi concert Siti Nohaliza for example, you listen it very, the, the sounds is very harmony, right? So when the sound is harmony, we call it as a musical musical sounds. So why? Because it comes in a repeated man repeated manners. That's why our ear are like favoring to listening to the that kind of that kind of music. Okay. So I mean that a sound, any other sounds that come with more than one frequency, we call it as the complex sounds, complex sound wave. Okay, so I did mention about the pitch just now. Pitch is basically a uh, sensations. So basically, uh, females gonna have high pitch and comparing to the to male. Uh, all right. So um, this is actually the audiogram for a uh, familiar sounds. Sometimes uh, they call it as the banana diagram. Okay. So uh, if you take a look at this diagram, you are gonna see that uh, we have this uh, yellow or banana shape in sides of this grid. Okay, so the banana shape is at, is telling you like is telling you that uh, the sounds that are coming in in that color in that yellow regions is basically the sounds that is perceived is 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 like welcoming sounds to your ear. Other than that, outside of that regions, you might feel that it's quite disturbing lah. If you take a look at this uh, diagram, you might see on the x axis towards the right. Uh, right side, it's actually uh, from low sound, low frequency to the high frequency, and down below here, from the high intensity, low intensity, the low intensity, uh, soft intensity down to the high intensity of the sounds. So, if let's say what uh, rustling of leaf, for example, eh, now rustling of leaf, you boleh dengar tak? Ah, boleh dengar sebab apa? Sebab kita punya telinga sensitive kan? Uh, within that 100 to 4,000 sensitive, right? But then, when you are playing like a uh, band, for example, ah, uh, their intensity dah dah increase. But what is the frequency of the band? It is 1,000, but its decibel is 120 decibels. But somehow we can say that our ear are actually uh, like a favoring on 20 to uh, 70 uh, decibels in loudness or intensity, and the frequency is coming from the uh, 250 to 8000 lah. Uh, so this is our normal hearing um, frequency and intensity of the sounds. Okay, so this is the wavelength. I did mention to you one wavelength is one frequent, one frequency. Uh, basically, it's, it's inversely related with frequency lah. Uh, a greater in a, a, a larger in a wavelength means greater lesser in the frequent frequency yeah. so now let's move on to the amplitude uh, amplitude is actually um, directly related with the frequency the higher in the frequency higher in higher in amplitude is higher in frequency and it is louder or high pitch high pitch sound comparing to the uh, lower a uh, lower ampli amplitude. Okay, so this is just the uh, dimensions about the loudness of the sounds that are coming in. The property of the sounds, we have the loudness. So this loudness, we call it as the deci decibel. Okay. So basically, our normal conversations is around 60, 60 decibels. If let's say you are shouting, so shouting is basically on 80, 80 decibels. So basically, when starting from 80 onwards, uh, you will no longer feel comfort comfortable. Okay, 
So now let's move on to the masking. So what is masking? So if you take a look at the definitions, masking is the process by which the threshold of hearing for one sound is raised by the presence of another sound. So it means that uh, sometimes uh, when you are listening, for example, like you are listening to my lecture right now, and at the same time, your brother is playing a game. So you have two, two things that you, do, you are listening to. But right now you are focusing to, to like you are deciding to focus on my lecture and you listening to my sounds better, to my voice better. So this is what we call as the masking, masking effect by which you increase the threshold for one frequency sounds and not the, uh, not the other. Right now let's move on to the transmissions of some wave. So how does the sounds being transmitted to uh, being transmitted into the inner ear and then how does our brain perceive it as a sound? So the sound wave is actually traveled in the external ear, okay, from the, uh, via the ear canal, and it hit the tympanic membrane, and then in the middle ear, it's caused vibrations of the uh, ossicles, right, and then it's hit the uh, oval window by the footprint of stapes, and then when the oval window being knocked in and out, it's going to produce another wave in the fluid field compartment, which is the perilim. And then it's going to it's going to produce a wave like the wave properties which I mentioned earlier, and this wave is going to hit at the basilla membrane, okay, at the resonant membrane, and then at the basilla membrane, then sensitizing the hair cells or the hearing receptors on top of the basilla membrane. Then all of this information is going to be sent to the uh, auditory possible uh, the auditory uh, cochlear nerve to the brain to be perceived as those sounds okay right now let's take a look at the mode of sounds transmissions or conduction so we have three mode of sounds transmissions so number one is the air conductions by which we believe that um, our external ear and middle ear we have the air field compartment so from these regions is going to uh, vibrate either the uh, either the, what do we call, the tympanic membrane or a secondary tympanic membrane, which is the one window. If, let's say, uh, your ossicles are being a problem, you don't have to worry because we still have the round window down the oval window that can still be knocked in and out to produce a vibrations by which these vibrations can be transmitted into the fluid field compartment perilim and also the endo, endo limb to produce a sound perception. Okay? So, believe me that in our body system, we have a backup system. Okay, so this secondary tympanic membrane or round window is not only to to assist the mechanical activity that occur in the original way, but somehow it can also be as a standby component, uh, ataupun the backup component lah. Okay, other than that, we have the ossicular conductions by which all of the um, uh, sounds can be transmitted via the mechanical. Uh, uh, component which is the ossicular bone and the last one other than the ossicular conductions we have another bone kind of conduction which is bone conduction which is the temporal temporal bone uh, so when you knock your head for example like you're not talking you're not listening to other sound but you are using a pen and then knocking your head you can still hear a, hear a sounds <clears throat> Okay, uh, I did mention to you already in the process of the transmissions of the sound wave in the inner ear. Uh, this one is just for your reference. Okay. Alright. Um, in the transactions of the sound wave, we have two types of potentials. We call it as the resting membrane potentials of the hair cells, by which our hair cell, kita the hair cells kan, mana hair cells ni, resting membrane potential still, adalah minus 60 millivolts and endocochlear potentials is 80 millivolts so means that the um, difference member potentials when you plus these two together it would be 140 40 millivolts so it is the potentials difference across the apical membranes of the uh, inner hair inner hair cells so this is just a process of depolarizations i did mention earlier but this one is just to recap in the genesis of the action potentials hair cells Alright, when we have the leaflet structure which we call it as the pectoral membrane by which being knocked in the endolimb from the knocking of the wave that being transmitted in the perilim on the resonant membranes and then knocking on the tectoral membrane that is pushed the stereocilia away 
they are the mechanical activity. So the hair cells, we call it as the mechano, mechanoreceptors. Okay, so why mechanoreceptors? Because it's being pushed mechanic mechanically. So when it pushed mechanically, it is mechano, mechanoreceptors. Alright, and then it causes a lateral bending of the cilia. When it's bent, it's going to force open the ion channel right on top of it and it's going to allow the influx of the potassium and calcium thus this calcium is going to change the membrane potentials causes the cells to undergo depolarizations and this calcium are basically going to assist in the movement of the neurotransmitter containing vesicles to the base regions thus releasing the neurotransmitters at the synapse before it goes to the afferent, afferent nerve okay so this is what going on and the process of repolarization but then when the tectorial membrane being lift up by the refraction process so it's going back to the repolarization state yeah okay just in and out lah in and out movement on and off movement okay so collectively we can say that the role of cochlea since it have a basilar membrane the hair cells and the tectorial membrane all of it going to works in a team thus producing or translating all of the sound wave or a medical, uh, mechanical sound wave that coming to it into the electrical, sig electrical signals. Therefore, we can say that cochlea play a transducing, transducing role. So what does that mean by transducing role? It's transduce. It's change from one mode of energy to another mode of energy. By which from the mechanical energy is transduced into the electrical electrical energy in our body by which it is known as the action action potentials all right full stop for that but we have to understand that other than that other than become a transducer these cochlea as well are actually acting like a place that encodes the frequency and the amplitudes of the sound wave okay so uh, i give you one example eh? when i ask a woman to shout Okay, shout louder, and then I ask a male to shout louder, and then can you compare which sounds is having a high frequency? You can, right? Because I did mention earlier that a female gonna have a high frequency sounds comparing to a male. Then, but other things inside our body that differentiate the sounds that oh, this is a high frequency sound, or oh, this male having a low frequency sound is actually the basilar membranes by which spray inside the co cochlea bear in mind our cochlea are come in a in a spiral shape but if you spray it open you will see that we have this one this plate by which on top of this plate if you spray it open it consists of the hair cell all the way Okay, so all the way of the basilar membrane, they are hair cell distributed on it. They are an arrangements of the hair cells by which this hair cell, each of the hair cells are responsible to detect or to encode the sensitivity, to encode the sounds that coming into it. Okay, right now, if you take a look at the basilar membrane, okay, I'm going to skip this. If you take a look at the basilar membrane, you will see that at the base, they have a uh, like a like a, a what do we call it? a narrow base comparing to the apex. If you take a look at the apex, the arrangements of the hair cell is basically wider. Okay, so why? Basically, in this hair cell, in this basilar membrane, at the base, it's going to detect the low frequency, uh, low frequency sounds. Sorry, high frequency sounds, but at the apex, it's going to detect the low frequency low frequency sounds okay if you take a look at this huh? narrower and wider it's just like a plate that is uh, thicker at the base and thinner at the thinner at the effect so basically it's going to shape less shape less comparing to the wider wider region macam plastic lah lagi tebal dengan nipis kat mana you boleh dengar Okay, sometimes if you take a look at the uh, xylophone, for example, uh, xylophone ke, piano ke, whatever, any musical instruments, you will see that each of it, they have a region that having a high frequency and a region that having a low frequency sound. So, why, so how does it be arranged? 
uh, is being arranged according to, according to our human system, according to the uh, placement of the inner cells in on top of the bacilla bacilla membrane. So this is a foot plate of stapes. So just imagine the oval window with a foot plate of stapes, and at the base going to detect the uh, high base sounds, a uh, high frequency sounds, and at the apex is the low frequency sounds. So how does this happen? You refer back to the properties of the sound wave. Kalau you tengok sound wave, okay, kita patah balik. Nak faham ni? Okay. Okay. Kalau you tengok sound wave, if you take a look at the sound wave, you boleh nampak eh. Kalau high pitch, dia pendek-pendek dan dia kerap. Bila dia pendek-pendek dan dia kerap, dia akan duduk dekat base. But bila dia panjang dan dia wavelength dia lebih panjang, okay, lebih jarak-jarak, so dia akan tag dekat bahagian apex. So that's how from the mechanical uh, properties of the sound wave itself, the, the, uh, the high frequency of the sounds or low frequency of the sounds, is going to tap on the different regions on the bacilla membrane. Then only the hair cells, okay, the hair cells that located in that location only will be activated or stimulated. Okay, so if let's say, eh, if let's say that I, have, that I have a high frequency sounds, when high frequency sound tap at the base, that uh, activate the, uh, the hair cells at the base, then the information will be sent to the brain. Oh, this is a high frequency sound. If let's say the sound is low in frequency, it will stimulate the hair cells in the apex. Oh, and then all the information will be sent to the brain. Oh, that's how my brain translate the low frequency sounds and high frequency frequency sounds by the help of the bacilla membrane stru structure. Okay. Hmm. So, we call it as the tonotopic organizations. Ah, ini kita panggil tonotopic organizations. Tone to organizations of the basilla membrane, the hair cells on top of the basilla membrane tu, menentukan tone tu. That's why we call it as the tonotopic organizations. Okay. Okay, sometimes we call it as well as the place coding or place theory of the auditory system lah. Hmm. Tengok sini. So, high frequency, the attack dekat base. A low frequency dekat uh, more towards the uh, apex lah. Hmm. Okay. So, some frequency discriminations, we got two types of how, how our brain uh, discriminate the sound frequency. Either the place, okay, by which at the bacilla membrane or the traveling of the wave. Uh, depending on the bacilla membrane that being tapped or by the traveling of the wave that coming into it. Uh, traveling wave tu maksudnya macam mana? Uh, macam ni lah. Kalau high frequency tu, dia travel less. Jadi dekat base lah. Kalau high, low frequency, dia travel further. So, dekat uh, apex. Alright. So, this is the traveling theory. Traveling wave. This is place. Place maksudnya dekat uh, kat mana? Kat mana dekat bersilam membrane tu. Okay. Okay. Mm. Okay. So, now let's move on to the uh, localizations of sound wave. Uh, so, for example, eh. Uh, I ask you to close your eyes and I ask your friends to be at anywhere either on a, on your right side or on your left side. And then I ask your friends to call your name. Okay? And then when I tell you, oh, can you guess where is the location that the sounds are coming from? Then you say, oh, it's coming from my right side. Or, it, or my friend is actually on my right side. And then how can you discriminate that the sounds coming from your right side or from your right, uh, left side? It's actually depending on the on the positions of your friends and also the traveling times of the sounds that come into your ear. Okay, so that's what does it mean by the localizations of the sounds, sound source. It's depending on the time arrival and also the intensity of the sounds and as well, don't forget that you have a pina. It's uh, the role of the, the role of the pina. Okay, like human, it's very rare to find a person that can like, like, uh, like tuning their pina like left and right, right? Uh, there's only a certain people can do that. But in cats, for example, they are able like to tune their pina like like moving front way or or behind or whatnot, right? Okay. But in human, we need to move it together with our our head. Okay. So this is a sound source. For example, like you have a you and you have a friend on your left side. And then when your friend calling you, the sounds will travel faster to the left ear comparing to the right ear because the 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 distance 
huh? the of the left ear and the right ear is different. So that's why you can say that oh I'm listening. Uh, the information is coming to my left ear first, comparing to my right right ear. So I can guess that my friend is on my right on my right side. So this is just the involve, events involved in the hearing. I think you can read by yourself. It's just an additional information for you as well as this one. Okay, so now basically we don't aware that we have a hearing problem until it goes abnormal. So we have two types of uh, hearing problem. We call it as deafness. Lah. Huh? So number one is the conductive deafness and the second one is the sensory neural deafness. If let's say we have a problem uh, which we cannot conduct the sounds that are coming into our ear, we can say it's a conductive deafness. If let's say it is not due to the mechanical component of the hearing organ, it's due only to the electrical component, we can say it is a sensory neural deafness. For example, like the one that blocking the receptors from being stimulated and whatnot, so it is actually the sensory neural deafness. Other than that, we have a mix. Mixed deafness. So mixed deafness meaning that they are rosak dua dua lah. Okay. So this is just uh, to show you sometimes when uh, uh, an aging people can say that oh they have a difficulty in hearing. So what is happening in this elderly is because the ankylosis of the uh, ossicles, right? Or sometimes due to the atrophic changes, uh -huh. or sometimes due to the deterioration of the of the hair cells by which all of it will lead to the progressive loss of the hearing. Uh, okay, we're done with the hearing part. We're going to continue with the um, uh, vestibular apparatus uh, in the functions of the equilibrium process, okay, in the second part. Okay, anyway, thank you very much. And what I can say, the quieter you become, the more you can hear. Okay, I will continue with the second part on the uh, vestibular apparatus and equilibrium, alright? Are you ready for the second part? So, for the second part, we're going to take a look still in our ear. But for this part, we're going to take a look on the vestibular apparatus as well as it functions on the equi equilibrium. So, earlier... We did take a look on the uh, functions of the ear for hearing. But right now, we're going to take a look at the functions of the ear towards the equi equilibrium. So, okay. Alright. So, let's take a look at the uh, outcome first. The first one is, as usual, you need to get to know the structure, the functional structures of the vestibular apparatus. And how does this vestibular apparatus aid in our uh, equilibriums? Okay, postural equilibrium and whatnot. And then what are the consequences of its abnormality? Alright. So now let's understand first on the equilibrium. So when we talk about equilibrium, it's actually talking about the balance. So in equilibrium, we, we will have two types of equilibrium. Either static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium. Okay. So what are the difference between these two uh, equilibrium. So as usual, static means static, tak bergerak. So static equilibrium, even though if I ask you to stand up or to stand, okay, pergi semayang ke, berdiri tegak ke, apa ke, iktidal ke, huh? alright. So, during that time, you are in a static motion. Huh? Tak ada motion lah, in a static position. So, that static position somehow, your body are actually still maintaining your posture so that you won't fall. So that once we call that once we call it as a static equilibrium. Okay, it means that you are going to like force your body against your uh, gravity, gravity. Okay, against the gravity. But the second one is the dynamic equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium is actually uh, positions while moving. All right. So how does your body maintaining your positions or your posture when moving? For example, like when you are walking. Okay, walk the jalan jalan sampai jatuh. Uh, kalau awak jalan-jalan and then awak jatuh, means that there must be a problem with the vestibular apparatus. Alright? So, masa awak baby, yes lah. It is because you are still training. But right now, if you're having that problem, uh, you better check. Okay? 
So that one we call it as the dynamic equilibrium. Or for another example, like you are riding a bicycle. So right now you are very expert in riding a bicycle. Sometimes uh, ada yang pergi cycling lah apa kan. Uh, boleh maintain ni. Even let macam mana pun you still can maintain your body posture without fall. So that one we call it as the dynamic equilibrium. So collectively, all the organs that maintain the equilibrium, we call it as the vestibular apparatus. Okay. So, now let's take a look at the structures in the vestibular apparatus. So, vestibular apparatus similarly to the uh, hearing uh, organ just now, the cochlea, whatever it is, we still have the bony labyrinth and we have the membranous labyrinth as well. So, the regions that the uh, grey colour in the diagram is actually the uh, bony labyrinth and the purple in colour is actually the uh, membranous, membranous labyrinth. So bear in mind, similar to the hearing structures, uh, in the vestibular apparatus also, we have two types of uh, fluid, which is the perilims as well as the endolim. Okay, by which the difference is just the same, by which in the endolim, they reach in the potassium. So why? Because in the generations, four generations of the action, action potential later on. Alright? So, in the vestibular apparatus, you can see we have like a handle-like structure right over here. Okay, we have one side on the right side and the left side of the ear. We have the vestibular apparatus. And this vestibular apparatus uh, actually consists of the semicircular canals as well as the utricles and the saccos. Okay, so nanti kita tengok slowly lah gambar dia macam mana. So, vestibular system is used to uh, maintain equilibrium and balance. So, how? They type the angular and linear acceleration. So, when we say angular acceleration tu macam mana? Maksudnya berpusing lah rotations. Rotate to the left, rotate to the right or like tilt your head to uh, forwards or backwards. So, that is the angular accelerations. And linear accelerations, what does that mean? Linear accelerations means moving front or backward or moving upward and downward. Maksudnya front forward in a linear plane lah. In a in one plane, for example, like, um, like riding a like riding a car or a train so in a linear plane or in the uh, horizontal accelerations like you naik lift uh, atas ke bawah ataupun you ride a celero celero shot kan pergi genting uh, tak, tak tahulah sekarang dah ada ke belum you ride a celero shot yang naik ke atas bila dia tarik turun ke bawah tu uh, that is also as a linear acceleration by which for linear acceleration it is detected by the utricle and seku, but for the rotations of the head is by the semicircular, semicircular canal. So basically, <clears throat> this vestibular system is not only maintaining your body posture, but it's also going to fix a visual image. So what does that mean? So other than like other than this structure is to maintain you from the fall, maintain you or help or assist you for walking, riding, or whatnot. It's only it's also functions to aid you for visual image. Uh, maksudnya, for you to see something. Maksudnya, while walking and whatnot. Okay? Alright. Masa kita dulu-dulu eh. Masa dulu-dulu, belum sebelum ada teknologi yang canggih, you had a camera. But then, can you cap the the your friends running? Uh, you take a video kan? You, kawan you lari kat depan, you ambil camera, you kejar kawan you. Sambil you pegang camera lah nak record dia berlari. Okay, if you take a look back or review back the uh, video that you took, what will happen? You akan nampak video tu shaking kan? You tak nampak pun kawan you lari and you akan rasa per pening. But right now, with the advancements of the technology, okay, you have a camera or sometimes you don't have a camera but you have a, a apparatus, we call it as a gimbal. Dah dengar gimbal? Uh, dia dah boleh fix dah. You punya camera tu, dia boleh shake camera you depending on the, you punya, apa, you punya, motion ke apa ke and then you can stick an image like real looking using your real eye ha, bukan tengok video nampak macam kita lari betul video tu really smooth or sometime right now you have a really good handphone for example like iphone ke bukan iphone je lah brand-brand lain pun dah canggih semua dia boleh cap the motion uh, dia boleh cap image a better or good image while moving Ha, so, tak nampak dah gegar-gegar tu semua. Dah cantik dah. Okay. So, that 
technology are actually coming from the human human body. Ha, so our body system dah ada dah teknologi tu. Cuba dia reflect balik masuk ke dalam teknologi punya digital punya uh, benda lah kan. Uh, apa nama? Device kan. Alright. So back to this uh, vestibular apparatus it's actually a sensor it's actually going to detect the um, to detect the motion and give a stable visual image for the for the retina so that it can balance your balance your body posture okay so uh, as i mentioned earlier this vestibular apparatus are detecting linear and angular accelerations but linear accelerations it stimulate the autolith organ and angular acceleration it stimulate the semicircular canal so kat mana pula ni where does this autolith organ located so why does this autolith organ uh, difference from the semicircular canals kind of apparatus okay we're going to take a look at it later all right so in autolith organ by which it's used to detect linear accelerations okay we have this structure utricle and saco by which both of it we call it as the autolith organ right and this autolith organ are actually used to detect linear accelerations to give equilibrium due to the linear accelerations meanwhile in the one that looks like the tree that looks like a handle like structures or a like bangles down here with the bar at the bottom is actually a semicircular canals and these semicircular canals going to detect or maintains the equilibriums at the angular accelerations okay so meaning that they dah cover semua dah maksudnya angular acceleration rotation semua being covered by the semicircular canal but the linear acceleration is being covered by the autolith autolith organ in the vestibular system okay so what about the hair cells the vestibular receptors similarly to the hearing the vestibular receptor also having a hair cells but it's kind of a bit different because they not only uh, consist of stereocilia okay but they also having one tall and thick like structures which is known as the kino kinocilium okay so why kinocilium cilium dium ni sebab singular kino ni kinetic cilia ni cilia okay so that's why kinetic cilia untuk kinetic ah okay so this is a kino kinocilium sebab dia nak detect pergerakan kan kinetic kan Okay, so the longer cilium is known as the kinocilium and the other cilium we call it as the stereo stereocilia or stereocilia. Okay, so this is actually the, the receptors for the vestibular apparatus. Alright. So similarly, they are directional sensitive. If let's say they move towards the taller kinocilium, okay, they will uh, cause depolarizations and in the other way around, it will cause hyperpolarizations. Alright, the, the, the mechanism is quite same okay so uh, now let's focus or zoom on the autolith organ first before we go to the semicircular canals we go to the autolith organ first okay so as i mentioned earlier autolith organs consist of utricle and sacros that detect the linear acceleration so why is difference from the semicircular canals it's because structurally they have one like a, a crystal like structures which is we call it as the autoconia and it is actually made of the um, calcium carbonate here calcium carbonate crystal or we call it as the autolith all right calcium carbonate crystal and this calcium carbonate crystals are actually cap all of these hair cells all right so why does for the linear accelerations we need this kind of things that because when you have a crystal carbonate crystal calcium, uh, calcium carbonate crystals on top of the cells is actually functions to give it is actually functions as a weight to give the inertia for the linear acceleration okay macam awak duduk dalam bus kan awak naik bus tiba-tiba bus tu tengah jalan ni tengah jalan 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 and then the bus stops what will happen to you you will move forward and then back backward so what do you call that in physics you, you call it as the inner inertia so why does there it why there is inertia that happen to you that is because of the weight so these calcium carbonate crystals are basically acting to put on weight for the fluid so that it can pull away the stereo stereocilium all right then it can activate the uh, it can activate the um, hair cells in the autolith organ okay so <clears throat> Since these uh, utricles and saccos, they have a hair cells that located in this region, we call it as the macula. We sometimes call it as the macula, macula hair cells. Okay? Mm. Alright, so this is uh, uh, the one in the utricles that will detect the horizontal plane. And the one in the saccos, it will detect the verticals, verticals plane. Okay. 
it will be activated when you move up and down and this one will be activated in the, in the ventricle when you move forward or backward in the linear accelerations all right so this is how it looks like okay you will have the fluid okay the jelly like structures and on top of it we have the autolyte that will put on weight and give an initial for the linear accelerations right okay <clears throat> just the same the mechanism is just the one that uh, we take a look at in the hearing but somehow the difference is that in the structure the, the, the locations of the hair cells the structures of the hair cells the locations of the hair cells as well as the uh, component that covered the hair cells which is the custom carbonate crystals all right the other than that the mechanism is just uh, the same okay so now let's move on to the semicircular canals you will watch your line okay now let's move on to the semicircular canals as i mentioned if you take a look at the shape itself you can tell that oh why they are in different planes that because they're going to detect the rotations in a different ang angle that's why this semicircular canal we have three and they are arranged in a different different planes okay okay so we have uh, this is a semicircular canal again all right okay the hair cells in the semicircular canals is a bit different because just now for the autolyte organ it is located in the macula but for the semicircular canals it is located in the uh, in the ampulla okay so this one we call it as the ampulla so if we take a look at the semicircular canal you will see that it's a bunch uh, structures at the base of the circles and this is actually the ampu ampulla okay ampulla and the hair cell is actually present in the crista ampullaris. Ah, ni crista ampullaris lah. Okay, crista ampullaris. Okay, so uh, for the uh, autolyte organ just now, we have the one that cover the hair cell is the autoconia. Okay, but for this one, we have a gel-like structure which is we call it as a cupula. Why do you call it as a cupula? Because it is uh, a cup-like structures that cover the hair cell. So they call it as the cupula. And inside it, it doesn't have the calcium carbonate crystals or whatnot because it's just going to detect. It's not detect accelerations, but it's detect the rota rotation. So there's no need the weight there. Okay, that's why there is no calcium carbonate crystals on top of the hair cell. But somehow, uh, they have a gel-like structures over here to give them to pull the gravity, uh, to give them a specific gravity. So it is actually similar to the endo endolin. Okay, so now let's take a look at these examples on its mechanisms of actions. If let's say you rotate your head to one side, for example, like you are rotating your head to the uh, to the left side. I just have to eh? uh, right, see the Okay, see so this is a cupula that consists of hair cells. If let's say you are rotating your head to the right side, the fluid in the this one in the uh, consists of perilim, eh? the fluids in the perilim going to push this way so means that you're going to push on the other on the other side okay similarly if you pull your head on the other way around rotate your head on the other way around it's going to push on the other on the other side causing depolarize depolarizations and hyperpolarizations okay mm. looking at the uh, if we take a look at combo on both left and right sides of the uh, cupula if you rotate your head to the right side you will see that the fluids or the endolin will move on this into this way okay it push the right sides to be depolarized and the left side to be hyper hyperpolarized so this is the directional planes of the semicircular candle okay all right so in the uh, vestibular pathway and its functions so autolyte organ as well as the semicircular canals so once it has been activated it's going to activate the eight cranial nerve and then uh, submit the information to the vestibular nuclei and it goes to the cerebellums uh, for the controls of balance and then a colomotor uh, uh, nerve nuclei for visual reflex and the spinal motor neurons for the postural postural reflex so this is how it's happened Okay, uh, for the vestibular reflex, we have two, either for posture, I did mention earlier, or the visual visual reflex. So, like, uh, if let's say I'm telling you, okay, I want you to look at the screen right now, okay, with your eye fixed to the screen, to your mobile screen or whatnot, 
and then turn your head to the right side. Okay, you will notice that the, your eye is going to move on the left side and your head is going to move to the right, to the right side in the opposite, opposite manner. So, how does it happen? Okay, like this. When you rotate your head to the right side, okay, you rotate your head to the right side, the endolim is going to move on the opposite way. So, it's going to push the hair cells toward the tallest kinocilium and cause the polarizations of the right ear, right vestibular apparatus, right? Right semicircular canal. So, the right semicircular canal is going to be activated, the hair cells are going to be activated and it will activate and send information to the vestibular cochlea, to the vestibular nuclei and it will shift to the left side abducens nuclei. From the left side of the abducens nuclei, the information is going to go to the lateral rectus muscles and contract the lateral rectus muscles of the left eye. But it's for the right eye, it's going to relay the information to the oculomotor nuclei, then cause contractions to the medial rectus muscles. That's why the muscles on the right eye and muscles on the left eye is being contracted differently okay uh, that's how your eye going to fix to kalau tak kalau dia sama-sama lateral contract lateral on the left side contract lateral on the left side of the right eye pun contract jadi ju juling uh, sebab tu tak jadi macam tu that's why it's shift to the abducens nuclei remember abducens nuclei going to activate the lateral rectus muscles of the same side and abducens nuclei when it relay to the oculomotor nuclei it going to activate the other, the other side lah. Okay. So, this is just an example. The one that I mentioned here. Ni, uh, ni example dia. Okay. So, basically, you will not notice that your vestibular apparatus going uh, problems unless you feel dizzy, bertaigo, sakit kepala, dizziness and whatnot, kan? And then you will say, hey, what happened to me? Oh, maybe my vestibular apparatus uh, having a problem. Uh, okay? So, for example, like um, motion sickness, eh? Uh, you ride the uh, boat to Pulau Perhentian, for example. And then, there is a very uh, wavy day. Okay? And windy day. And then, you get motion sickness when once you uh, arrive at the destination okay so why is that happen that is because you have the overstimulations of the vestibular apparatus all right so similarly on the vertigo uh, vertigo to apa vertigo means that when you 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 are sitting for example and but at the same time you feel like you are moving uh, that is vertigo lah so we have a physiological vertigo we have a central position vertigo peripheral labyrinth vertigo and also benign positional vertigo so basically uh, for benign uh, positional vertigo it's happen in elderly lah uh, assuming your particular head positions but it is not okay uh, I think that's all for this part okay uh, if let's say you have a problem in understanding on either hearing or the equilibrium uh, please feel free to ask okay uh, that's all for today for my lecture uh, this is okay next time